Week 35. Why do I always begin the podcast with that? Well, it tells you where we're at as we're going through the Bible in a year. We're at week 35. That's pretty good. Now, if you just, if you have just joined us, I mean, that's fine. That's great. Just keep on keeping on, right? Keep on trucking, as the uh, grateful <laughs> dead used to say. Why would you name your your band Grateful Dead? How could you be gratefully dead? Well, you know, we did cover that in Romans 6. If you're a Christian, you could be great, gratefully dead, right? Dead to sin. Anyway, I don't listen to Grateful Dead anyway. Uh, this is Jerry Rothhauser, by the way, and this is Spiritual Rants as we go through the Bible in a year with the one-year Bible readings. So that means this week would be like August 27th through September 2nd, and we'd be covering Job 23, the end of the book, through Ecclesiastes 3, Second Corinthians through chapter 6, at least part of it, Psalm 41 to 46, but we've already covered, so you don't have to read that again if you don't want to, but you should probably want to. And then Proverbs 22, 5 through 15. So the overarching topic is going to be <laughs> bleak, suffering. The problem of, and you've heard this one before, why do good people have bad things happen to them, right? And by the way, you know, it's good you're listening to the podcast, but um, I cover all of this material in a, in a deeper way at my blog, spiritualrants.com. And my goal was to shrink that all down for people that work, say, eight or nine to five every day. So they don't have a lot of time. So I shrunk it down. And then I've shrunk it down even more in the podcast. And next year, I may even shrink it down more and, and have a shorter podcast. That might be a miracle. You might have to call Ripley's if that happens. Anyway, don't forget what Churchill said, keep buggering on. Although, you know, I may say more like keep the blessing on <laughs> by reading every day. It's a blessing to read the scripture. I don't know why people don't do it, especially when they call themselves, of course, Christians. Now, what I notice, you know, in Indiana, my home state, it looks like the there's more people than anywhere else in the country, by far, reading my blog. But also in Florida, where I think there's a lot of people knocking on heaven's door. But it could be that it's people who are hurting, and those are the ones who should be reading the Bible Every day, there was a lady I met at a concert in the Chicago area. She had lost her mother like a few weeks before that. And worse than that, much worse than that, she had lost her son, who was in the 20s, in his 20s, when he had died. Can you imagine? That might be, well, it's not worse than Job, but maybe similar. And then I watched the movie last night. Out, out in the movies, we saw Dunkirk. And I thought, my goodness, these poor young guys in the movie retreating from out of France back to England. Their ships blowing up and them then uh, ending up in the water reminded me of the hit on Pearl Harbor 
where our guys were trapped in ships or caught on fire, covered with oil. Horrible things. And that's why the book of Job is in the Bible. He had a pretty tough time of it. He was covered in boils. He had lost his family, except for his wife, who was nagging at him. So this is his story. And we found out last week that the curtain had been pulled on the inner chamber up in heaven where Satan had access to go and and mope and attack the Lord's integrity. And the Lord talked back to Satan and said, Hey, how about this guy Job? How about him? Why don't you consider him? (laughs) I'm glad Job didn't know that. In fact, for a lot of us, we don't know what's going on in that way. Sometimes when we can't figure out what's going on in our lives and it's bad, really bad, it could be God has made an example of us if we have been true to him. That's why, you know, I tell people it's not prosperity gospel. That's true. You know, and I told you about one of the famous prosperity teachers. He had an answer for Job. And he makes fun of people who ask him that. And they say, oh, what about Job? And his answer is, he picks the the verse in Job that says that what he had feared had come upon him. And so that prosperity says, well, yeah, that's why Christians suffer, because they fear and they don't trust God. Well, (laughs) No, because Job had trusted God, and all this happened to him. So I gave you a number of things that could be reasons why bad things happen to people. The last one on the list is kind of Job, where he suffers because of Satan attacking him. All right, well... I've been blitzing through Job. I just couldn't take forever, especially the account of Job and his friends, quote unquote, his friends. He had three of them and there were three, basically three cycles of Job talking to them and them uh, giving a hard time to Job. And you see what happened to them. Then there's a fourth friend, and he does better than the other three, but he isn't even mentioned at the at the end. And God punishes those three friends for giving Job a hard time. All right, let's let's get into it. I want to cover the main verses that are quoted out of Job as well as give you a taste of what's going on there. But remember, you know, a lot of people, when they read um, in times past, not now, they read comic books. But, you know, people read Dickens in the 1800s, and they would just sit down and read a lot. They didn't have TV, they didn't have radio. So they had time to read Job, and we should. Verse 10 of Job 23, Job says, He knows the way I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Well, he had good self-esteem. But he, he knew he had been true to God, and he didn't deserve what was happening to him, and he was right. Verse 1 of 31, there wasn't the internet with rampant, Pornography. I mean, you can't hardly watch a baseball game without a girl in a bikini eating a sloppy hamburger. And I can guarantee she didn't look like that if she was eating a lot of those hamburgers. But Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? 
I remember when I was a kid, which is an, an amazing thing in itself since I'm so old. Um, I went to Catholic school uh, for catechism. I went to a public school otherwise. I remember the nuns uh, because they were so upset about women wearing bikinis. They had pretty much covered themselves before that point. That tells you how old I am. And, you know, Job would have been challenged, I think, in 2017. Now, in 38, there's a shift where Job had been wanting a face-to-face with God, and then he got it. And I'm not sure that he's happy (laughs) that he would have gotten a face-to-face with God, but God extrapolates from nature to show how powerful he is, how creative, intelligent. I mean, those words don't really apply in in enough of a fullest sense, sense of who God is, but the way he gets through to Job is going through nature. So you can read through that, and you will be wowed, I think, reading that. And a couple of things you'll, you'll come across, a behemoth and a leviathan in 40 verse 15 and 41 1. One of them's like an alligator, one's like a hippopotamus. Now, whatever you think they are, they're gigantic animals. I think a hippo and maybe a crocodile. You can come up with whatever with whatever you want on those, but they were huge. All right, chapter 42, we get the conclusion of the book. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak, and I will ask you, and you will instruct me. He's quoting himself in there, too. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. He felt like an idiot. (laughs) Which is... My idiot rule, by the way, my idiot rule is that when I get upset with God and then I see what he's doing at the end, I feel like an idiot. So when I get upset with God, I try to remind myself that I'm an idiot before I go harping on things to God. Here's what happened to his friends. Verse 7 of 42. It came about after the Lord had spoken to these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Tamanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends. See, the fourth guy is left, left out of this. Because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now, therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls, seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job will pray for you. So Job came out pretty good at the end. In fact, it even gets better. Now, remember in the Old Testament that prosperity was by uh, material things. A lot of it was material and spiritual. In the New Testament, we don't see the apostles and disciples riding around in in big chariots, you know, gold emblazoned on the side. 
Yeah, we with Michelin tires, we don't see that. It's a spiritual blessing for the most part. Now, we have been blessed in America for being faith to God, faithful to God over the years. And some Christians are blessed. But there's no guarantee in the Old Testament there is. So anyway, we'll talk more about that as we go on, as we talk about vows, like in uh, Ecclesiastes. Anyway, Eliphaz, Bildad, not Bilbo, Bildad, and Zophar went and did as the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job. He restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. And let me explain something about that. So Job was rewarded materially, you know, and animals and all of that. And when you look through what happened, he had the same wife, (laughs) which I hope was starting to bless him instead of, quote unquote, blessing him like earlier in the book. Anyway, he did not have double in sons and daughters. All he had was another seven sons and three daughters. Why is that? Well, because he hadn't lost completely his first seven sons and daughters. They were in heaven. So that's why. And everything else, he got double from what he had had originally. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, camels, yoke of oxen, donkeys, etc. And one of his daughters was named Jemima. And you know what that means. It means that Job had pancakes the whole rest of his life. No, it, but she she was good looking. She must not have been eating a lot of pancakes. And then, of course, you know, they got married and that extended Job's family. He lived 140 years and saw his sons and his grandsons and four generations. Isn't that amazing? So I would say... The answer in Job really is the same point that Solomon makes in Ecclesiastes. And here's what it is. You remember Chevy Chase? Is it Chevy Chase or Chevy Chase? Anyway, you remember him, the comedian on TV. And on Saturday Night Live, he used to say, I'm Chevy Chase, and you're not. And that's how we began his newscast. Remember that? Here's the point to Job. God said to Job, I'm God, and you're not. I think that's pretty good summation of the book. All right, so you can wrestle with Job, and maybe more so when we get into um, Ecclesiastes. And by the way... Uh, if, if you're reading through the first time through the Bible, first three chapters of Job and the last few chapters of Job, and you can skim through most of the middle of the pugilism involved between Job and his friends, and I've already given you the main scriptures to remember that are quoted from there. Okay, Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon, who wrote Proverbs that you're reading every day, right? And he may have been referred to in your version as a preacher or a teacher. No matter what they put in there, he's trying to figure out life. He may be in a midlife crisis, actually. And it's written by Solomon. It says, son of 
David king in Jerusalem. In verse 2, the preacher in New American Standard says, Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Now that Hebrew word for vanity is hebel, or I'm probably not pronouncing it right. I read a little Hebrew, I don't pronounce it. <laughs> hebel, something like that. Anyway, what it reminds me of is dandelions. They come up in the summer, and they're just fluff, and you can pick one. You shouldn't, because then they sprout and you have more weeds. But if you take one of those things and you blow on it, and the seeds just go in the wind, that, I think, is a representation of vanity. Vanity of vanities. And that's what he's thinking life is. So we'll wrestle through Ecclesiastes, at least the first three chapters in this podcast. And then we'll pick up from there. You can get some good books as helps. You know, I've mentioned the Bible Knowledge Commentary or J. Vernon McGee has a Through the Bible Commentary. Wearsby, Warren Wearsby has a set of commentaries out. They're all really good. If you want to pick something up that's a lot more inexpensive and shorter and shrunk up, there's the Bible for Dummies, which I relate to. Here's what they call Ecclesiastes. Their title for it is Life Stinks and Then You Die. (laughs) Maybe a little bit too... Pessimistic, but pretty accurate. But we'll get to the end eventually. And I think the ending says kind of the same thing as Job. But I'll, I'll get you there. Which is, fear God is the end of a... Cle- okay, now you don't have to listen to next week's podcast. Oh, well. But I think that's the answer to Job, too. You know, God is God, and you're not. A lot of people don't realize that. They're called fools in Scripture, especially in Proverbs, but also uh, in Ecclesiastes. Fool is a kind of a technical term for an unbeliever, which, if you think about it, Someone who hasn't trusted God and had a relationship with God, which I think is the theme of the Bible, is having a relationship with God leading to life. Rebellion against God leads to death. That person who rebels against God is a fool. All right, this keeps coming to mind, so I'm going to have to mention it, even though I haven't gotten to a scripture yet on that. But I mentioned prosperity preachers. And so years and years ago, I called one of them on the phone because they invite people to call on the phone. And when you do, they say, would you like to make a vow to God? And I thought, oh, okay, I'm pretty clever. I'll just say to them, where is that in the Bible? And guess what? They were trained with Bible scriptures, mostly in the Old Testament. Because it applies to the Old Testament, not now. We're in the church age of grace, not in proving to God our worth through the law and through keeping vows and those kinds of things or tithing. Anyway, I didn't know what to say. I just wrote down the scriptures this lady had given me. Uh, I didn't pledge any money to that pastor, preacher, fraud, by the way. And I wrote them down, and I thought, oh, my goodness. Um, that, that looks about right. What do I do with that? Well, what you do with that is that you're reading 
out of the New Testament in the church age, and the Old Testament gives us illustrations, but we are really, we're even warned in Scripture not to vow to God. And if you do, you better keep it. But that's Old Testament. So if you vowed to some prosperity teacher at this point, um, you're not obligated. He's a fraud, and he's misinterpreting Scripture. All right, back to Ecclesiastes. I said to myself, Solomon said to himself, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility. So there are going to be a lot of things repeated, themes, in Ecclesiastes. One is vanity, and other is futility. But remember, another phrase is under the sun. So what he's talking about is just what's on earth. And he's not even thinking as a believer, He's acting as an unbeliever because he's testing everything. He's not trusting scripture or anything like that. It's like, okay, I came into the world, and what should I do with myself? And the first thing I'll try is just to have a lot of fun. Well, you know, a lot of people have a lot of fun, right? And everyone I know that just accumulate things and have a lot of fun have empty lives that I know. I mean, uh, look up the, you know, look at an inquirer or, you know, most of the junk. I try to read the Yankees and then all these side articles about nuts and rich people and celebrities. They don't seem to having have a very full life anyway. And so that's kind of the conclusion that Solomon came to. And we knew that he experimented in science. He had a lot of wives. He had concubines. He, not cubicles, he had concubines. And slaves, male and female slaves. He was very, very rich, filthy rich. And silver and gold, he had all of that. Verses 6 through 8 in Ecclesiastes 2. And verse 9, I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. He, was, he had been the, even David, his father, is what he's saying. He was the greatest king. My wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. You know, he must have Amazon Prime. And then verse 11 of chapter 2, I considered all my activities which my hands had done, and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity, there it is again, and striving after wind. And there was no profit under the sun. There's that phrase again. You go through reading, you can underline those, you know, as you come across them. There's one I love, I hope I find it for you, probably next week. Uh, he, He compares something to like grasping oil (laughs) with his hand. That'd be a mess, wouldn't it? And difficult to do. 2.12, he considered wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do who will come after the king himself except what has already been done? And I saw that wisdom excels folly as light, excels darkness, So what he's saying, whatever has been done, has been done already. And he'll say that straight out. Man's eyes are in his head for a wise man, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. Verse 15, I said to myself, As He's talking to himself a lot, isn't he? As is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. 
Why then have I been extremely wise? Remember, God had given him the gift of wisdom. And he said, that too is vanity. There it is again. For there, Hubble, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool. Which is true. I mean, if you think about it, we think about Washington, Jefferson, uh, Lincoln as wise men. We don't, we don't remember them very often. In fact, we used to commemorate their birthdays, and now it's President's Day. Which, which one? So it's not even Lincoln's birthday or Washington's birthday anymore. How the wise man and the fool alike die. So death is really the thing that should wake everyone up. You know, that there's funerals, and he talks about that later. In verse 17, he's hating life. He says, so I hated life. (laughs) I have my youngest brother, and that that used to be his favorite phrase. I don't know now, but used to be. You know, well, he wasn't talking about himself necessarily, although he could have been. But, you know, it's like if the Yankees won or lost... 10 in a row. They're hating life. But anyway, there's nothing better for a man than to eat and drink. That's what he's coming to that conclusion, at least at this point. Verse 24 of chapter 2. Have you heard of the Epicureans? My mother used to get uh, candy or something from some company called the Epicureans. It was candy. But the Epicureans, back in Greek philosophy, that was their philosophy. So have a good time. They probably liked good candy, too. Anyway, but his conclusion in Ecclesiastes 2, around verse 25, again, vanity and striving after wind. Chapter 3 was written by the birds. No, Pete Seeger, no. By Solomon. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for everything, every event under heaven, a time to give birth, to die, to plant, uproot what is planted, time to kill, time to heal, time to tear down, to build up, to weep, to laugh, mourn, etc. You know this, don't you? It's from Turn, 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 the bird song. And it was ripped by Pete Seeger from Ecclesiastes 3. I think that even says that on the label of the 45 for the the birds, that it says it's from Ecclesiastes, which is kind of cool. One of them, at least, uh, became a believer. I've interviewed him. He's a pretty strong believer. Verse 12 of Ecclesiastes 13, there's nothing better than to rejoice and do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor, it's the gift of God. So when you fear God, when you trust God, you can really enjoy a meal. I think that's what, no, that's what it means. Verse 17, I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man for a time, There's a time for every matter and for every deed. And that's part of his summing along as he moves through this book. The fates of sons of men and fate of beasts is the same, verse 19. All go to the same place. And when you're reading that first time, you think, huh? Men and animals all end up in the same place when they die? Well, it's under the sun. Remember that? So verse 20, the end of that, all came from dust and all returned to dust. That's where you get that at funerals, from dust to dust, right? Then he says, Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of the beast descends downward to the earth? And he's talking about their souls. 
who knows if animals go to, to heaven or not, or even men. I mean, at this point, he didn't know. Or he's saying he didn't know. Verse 22, I have seen that nothing is better than that man should be happy in his activities, for that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? And I can't understand in life, you know, I see people, even older people, and they haven't trusted God. I don't get it because there's death. Can't you see it? It's all around us. There's funerals. People around you are dying. Um, You need to think about eternal things. We get that in the book of Second Corinthians. But one note further about the beasts and human beings. When my son was being delivered, he had a pediatrician and or an obstetrician, whoever delivers babies. And somehow we got in a discussion. He said, you know, Just look at what's on the road. This is in uh, Texas. It was probably armadillos, but he didn't say that. They get mushed. They're raccoons in Indiana, squirrels. And he said, if you see the inside of a squished animal and a human being, they're basically the same thing. Now, that's kind of interesting, I think. Because what distinguishes animals from men? Someone, lots of people, talk about fellow creatures. Well, not quite. Animals can't relate to God. Human beings can. So, anyway, and I don't understand, you know, like, people getting older. There's one who won't eat animals. I saw him recently in almost a three-hour concert. And I think what keeps him going is doing the concerts. He's 75 years old. And I thought, why is he not thinking about eternal things? Well, because he can go out on the road and sing and get adulation from thousands and thousands of fans, I guess. All right. Second Corinthians, Paul has a problem. He wrote this. He's an apostle. We know he's an apostle, right? They didn't know. They couldn't go to Barnes and Noble, pick up a Bible, a New Testament, and see a lot of it's written by Apostle Paul. They just had this not very good looking guy with a big nose with bad eyesight showing up in a robe. And preaching. I oversimplified that. But that's part of what's going on. And remember in 1 Corinthians, they were called saints. They also in sec- they were called that in 2 Corinthians. Because they are from God's point of view. He sees them at, through Christ as saints. But they had multiple problems. One was... A fella who was living with his mother-in-law or having an affair. And Paul said, uh, extricate him. And they did. So in 2 Corinthians, verse 6 of chapter 2, he has to say, sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. And in other words, Let them back in, as that one singer would sing. Let them in. Don't overdo it. Show them love. And I explained all of that discipline in a church last podcast, so I won't repeat it. Chapter 12, he says a door was open for him in Corinth, and that's why he was there. In chapter 1, he says he was delivered from so great a peril of death that he had just described in previous verses and will deliver us, God will deliver him. 
He on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. So God delivers us either on earth in this life, or we're permanently delivered from sin in heaven as believers. In verse 14, I love this. I'll read it to you. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma from death to death, to other to the other an aroma from life to life, and who is adequate for these things. A picture here is like a procession after there's a victorious army in a parade. And they have a certain aroma. And what I tried to do to bring that home to our congregation out in the country years ago is I had some friends of mine squirt some perfume around the back of the church to illustrate that we have a good aroma and savor to the Lord. And, uh, one of the poor elderly ladies had really bad allergies and read me out for that, but <laughs> I probably deserved it. I thought it was a good idea. But I think that as Christians, when you hang out with some non-Christians, they may hate you, and they don't even know why. There is a lady I know that despises me, and she's hardly ever heard me preach that would be reason, maybe, to despise me. She, If I'm somewhere, she leaves. And I think part of it is this aroma. You know, it's aroma, an aroma of death to unbelievers, if they smell a Christian coming. But for good, committed Christians... You know, they like the the scent. It's a spiritual thing. Okay, you probably know what I'm talking about. Or you should. Chapter 3, We are, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need a letter of commendation to you f- or from you? You know, a certificate of apostleship that's signed by the Lord? Because... They weren't submitting to his authority. They weren't listening to him. And so he tries to validate his apostleship. And people were talking about him. And I've mentioned before that if a minister doesn't have integrity, he doesn't have anything. He can't minister. And when I was first ministering out in the country, first thing I was Um, insulted by, but accused of, was not telling the truth. Well, that was Satan's way to undermine my ministry. But I would answer all of comers, all of the comers who tried to do that. And uh, it kind of died down, I think, for the most part. Verse 6 of chapter 3 has made us adequate servants of a new covenant. See, there's he understood the the new covenant and the new testament and it's different from the old testament. Of course he wrote about it all all of the time, especially in Gal- Galatians we'll see that. Not of the letter but of the spirit, for the letter kills but the spirit gives life. So if we try to live in an old testament way by the law It's going to wear us out. Trust me, it will. The alternative is to live by the Spirit. We've talked about that. Check out the other podcasts, especially in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3 or spiritualrants.com. This used to be on the banner 
of the Indianapolis News or whatever the other paper was. They used to have this, 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, is liberty. And then verse, well, 16, 17, the Lord is the Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. Okay, verse 17, verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. We sing that, we sing that song in church, that we're being transformed from glory to glory, which is the Christian life. Unfortunately, it's from suffering most of the time and worshiping the Lord, and we move from one stage of glory to another, even in this life, and perfect it in the next. Chapter 4, verse 3, our gospel is veiled, but it's veiled to those who are perishing, unbelievers. Verse 4 is real important. I learned that real early in my Christian life. It says, those who are perishing, in whose case the God of the world, that Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Who, why, or how, how should you pray for those who are not saved? Pray that God will lift the veil that's placed there on the minds by the God of this world. And it's the God of this world. That's, again, why I don't understand why people are just trying to grab all the gusto they can grab in this life. I see the big houses around uh, the ponds, the, the, you know, large or smaller lakes or whatever, you know, big houses and mansions, yachts, boats, big cars. I, I guess there's nothing completely wrong except that it usually... You know, it's like trying to fit through the eye of a needle. You don't want to be a camel or even smoke them. Underline this one, memorize it. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bond servants for Jesus' sake. There is a preacher I know. He went to the same seminary I did years before me. And he says, don't memorize scripture. There's no reason to memorize scripture. All right. Uh, what did I just say? No, he's not. That's not smart. <laughs> you know, if you want to be a disciple, you have to be disciplined. You should memorize scripture. All the disciples did. That's how we got our scriptures. It wasn't just they remembered what he said. They memorized what he said. And that's pretty important to get our lives straight. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord. And I've recommended it. Get a topical memory system. You can get it in a box. I think you can get it just online now. It's not expensive. 60 verses you should learn. And a, a little book like called Beginning with Christ. And it's got five scriptures in there. That really, those are even more important than the 60 maybe. To memorize those. Verse 16 of chapter 4. We do not lose heart, but though our outer, outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Weight of Glory from there. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but all, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So that's, that should be our focus. Read um, like the beginning of 1 John chapter 3, first few verses there.
or also, like we'll get there, uh, Colossians 3, of how we should have our mind set on God and eternal things. 2 Corinthians 5.13, we are beside ourselves. You ever been beside yourself? That's where that phrase comes from, I believe, when you're beside yourself. He says, in his case, it is for God, not just because you're really angry or ticked. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ, I like the King James actually there, constrains us. NASB controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. We'll get to Galatians 2.20 says kind of the same thing. And there's a, a lady who's gone on to heaven who taught me this saying. He paid a debt he didn't know so that because we had a debt that we couldn't pay. I mess that up every time. <laughs> He paid a debt he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? You try it. All right, 2 Corinthians 5.16. A lady on my blog asked about this. Therefore, from now, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him in this way no longer. What I said in the blog was, you can look it up. When you look at people, you shouldn't just see them as people. You see them as spiritual entities. If it's the clerk at the grocery store, your co-workers, people in church, think of them as spiritual entities. Do they need to be saved? Do they need to hear the gospel? Do they need a spiritual friend? In fact, Paul said he just saw Christ as a man. But no longer, he says, the end of verse 16. Now this one, if you hadn't memorized it already, this one you should memorize. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Wow. There is your understanding of life. Verse 18, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. The result is we're supposed to be ambassadors. Verse 20, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's our message, reconciliation to God, having a relationship with God that leads to life. Verse 21, did Jesus ever commit a sin? Verse 21, it's also in Hebrews 4. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our hand our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Technically, we call that substitutionary atonement. In other words, Jesus paid the price. He paid it all, as a hymn we used to sing and should sing. He paid a debt he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. There it is. If someone asks you, they could just put things off. Chapter 6, verse 2, Paul quotes the Old Testament, At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now, he says, is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I preached a sermon. No, I was doing communion one day. 
And I said, we need to get right to God and do it now. And if you aren't saved, you need to get saved because you don't know what's going to happen. And I said, we had run over a dog on the way to church out in the country. And it ran out in front of us. And trust me, my wife loves animals. And she was driving. She was very upset about it. We had to go back after church and talk to them, tell them what happened. They said, oh, yeah, it runs out all the time. And we hit this dog. It died. And a lady was so upset that I would talk about that during communion. Um, I think her communion was more um, important to her than, than God, unfortunately. But that is the case, just like beasts and human beings are different. But death comes to them, and we need to keep that in mind. Paul said that he had an open heart for the Corinthians, not that he had had surgery, and that they should have an open heart for him. Verse 11 of chapter 6 is a key. I think I even have a commentary on 2 Corinthians. It's called, like, Open Heart. Now, I mentioned this, I have mentioned it a lot of times already, 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. So, in other words, don't believe, don't marry an unbeliever. Remember at the end of Ezra, they had married a lot of pagan women. And then they divorced them when Ezra cracked the whip, which is not an option in the New Testament, by the way. You can't just say, oh, yeah, my wife is an unbeliever. I'm going to divorce her. Yeah, it doesn't work. But on the other hand, don't marry an unbeliever. That's Meshuggah. That you're nuts if you do that. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. That has application for business dealings too. It doesn't mean you can't buy a peach from an unbeliever or anything like that or an unsaved person owns a grocery chain. But it does mean that you don't want to go into business that closely with someone and be partners with them. Verse 15, what harmony has Christ with Belial? By Belial, he meant Satan, another name for him. What has a believer in common with an unbeliever? And he goes on from there. We are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them, walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Quoting the Old Testament. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? In other words, you're the temple of God. They are the temple of, well, you figure it out. Verse 6 of Proverbs, quickly through, through Proverbs, you've already read Psalms. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Does that mean that all of your children will be believers? Not necessarily, but they're sure thinking about it. And not only that, they're probably on the moral side. Probably. So... Someone has said, train up the child in the way he should go means if he's, like, um, musically inclined, get him a musical education, a private teacher. Uh, if he does well with computers, buy him a computer. Well, that's probably all true. That's probably all true. And the spiritual aspect is certainly part of that. The rich rules over the poor, and a borrower becomes the lender's slave. So what's that tell you about borrowing? Trust me. <laughs> if you can avoid it, sometimes, you know, 
you, you can't uh, avoid it. And someone says, as a Christian advisor, don't buy things that depreciate. But sometimes, you know, you need a car. But if you don't need a car, the motto would be, if in doubt, do without. We were in Romans 14 about that, around verse 23. Verse 9, he who is generous will be blessed. He who gives some of his food to the poor. God will take care of people. I mean, try the. I think the rule is stretch, don't strain. So you don't give everything away, and you're out on the street. But you know, if you have two coats, what are you supposed to do? Give one of them away. Verse ten: Drive out the scoffer, and contention will go out. Even strife and dishonor will cease. Now I don't know what to do with our country. Because we have a lot of people who are mockers and scoffers. You talk to them, and that's all they do. They make fun of things. I used to be one of them. I still do it now, but hopefully I'm making fun of, you know, secular things to show the folly of them. But anyway, the, the nation's just filled with that right now. Verse thirteen twenty two. Proverbs sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I will be killed in the streets. That's like the um, adult's version of the dog ate my homework. You know, I can't go out. I can't do anything. There's a lion out there. It will be, it will devour me. Verse 14, the mouth of an adulteress is a deep pit. He who is cursed of the Lord will fall into it. The nation's falling into that. Adultery, spiritually, physically, the internet. Verse 15, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. What's that say about spanking? I got spanked uh, probably too much. Not probably, I, I got spanked too much. But occasionally what I do is I just string it out with my kids. Now, they're grown, so they're lost cause. No, they're wonderful kids, actually. But, you know, with my son particularly, I'd, I'd spank him. And, and then the next time I would say, remember that spanking? So, you know, I would get more value out of a single, a single spanking. A spanking, and I would certainly spank him like I was spanked, but then my younger brother approached me one time, and he said, really, you would spank your, your kids? It's in, in Scripture, and we don't have enough of it, and that's part of why the, the country is the way it is. All right, so that's week 35. You know what next week would be then? Week 36 will f- um, follow up. And finish Ecclesiastes and more Second Corinthians, a little bit more Proverbs, and keep buggering on. Keeping blessed is really what it is. And this is Jerry Rothhauser. Check out my blog, spiritualrants.com, and I hope you'll be downloading week 36 next week. <music>